Hello and good evening. Hi, right, how are you doing today? Can anyone hear me? Oh, I think you guys must be on mute. Let me see. Um, let me try and unmute you, then you can mute yourself. Hi, Kazi. Hi. Um, hi, Tosin. Hi, Olu. Hi, Sherry. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi, Shola. Hi, Titus. Um, hi. Hi, T. Hi. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be starting very soon, um, as usual. Oh, I think I'm really echoing really bad. Um, can everyone please mute themselves? Thank you. Um, I'm just going to give the rest of the guys uh, three, maximum four more minutes to see, um, because today's the last session. And I plan to... to finish this um, as soon as possible before half nine. Um, I don't want to keep anyone to uh, longer than they should in the call. <clears throat> in the meantime, um, um, I can take questions. If you've watched the previous videos or you, you, in regards to what we've covered, um, you think you want to just, uh, you want me to clarify, um, please feel free to ask me any question at the moment before I kick off. And I'll be happy to take it. Thank you.
Hello, guys. Um, I am Steve. Yeah, I'm just gonna give uh, the rest of the guys uh, that have not joined yet two minutes maximum. Then I'll kick off. Um, just to give another an extra grace of two minutes, then I'll kick off. In the meantime, please um, be with us. Thank you. Okay, guys, I think I'm just going to start and kick up from here. Um, hi, everyone. You're welcome to today's session, um, the final session, actually, the fifth session from the five um, series. So we started on Monday. For some of us who might be joining us for the first time or you joined us late or sometimes in between, um, you're welcome. <clears throat> We've made the um, we've made the previous recording available on our YouTube channel. However, there are some videos on our YouTube channel that is not accessible except you request specifically or you uh, an existing um, um, GMB community. If, if you're part of our WhatsApp group, then yes, you are. If you're not, then probably maybe you're new or you're just about to join. So we have. Um, I think we have three, four WhatsApp group, a minimum of about 40 to 50 in each WhatsApp group. So we try as much as possible to keep people updated, although sometimes the WhatsApp group might be very quiet because we only communicate important and necessary information. Yeah. Okay, so what, that will change very soon. We're trying to migrate everyone into an app if possible, depending on how this whole pandemic um, situation goes through. So um, back to today's discussion. So my name is Steve Oliver Moye. Um, I'm the lead delivery at Gray and Black. Um, we have other three other um, uh, support. We have two tutors. We also have two, actually four. We have Clara Raj, who actually helps with the admin stuff. And we have three, five people. We have another lady who also help out with the our foundation sessions so yes i am the lead um and to today's session now in in the previous sessions we've talked about kyc yeah we also talked about the component of kyc but what we did not dive into is aml assessment and screening and the reason is because this session is focused on just kyc however I will just highlight on here mail screening. That's the sanction adverse media screening. And just to give you a bit of flair on what that feels like, and also talk about transaction monitoring. Just a little bit of it as an highlight. So I'll be going in depth. And just to, just to refresh our memory. Yeah. So KYC stands for know your customer. Yeah. And it's funny that KYC is, is very significant, it's a significant element um, in today's. Um, fight against financial crime and money laundry, and it involves customer identification and verification. And verification. KYC, like I said, means know your customer. KYC requires a check, a mandatory process of identifying and verifying the identity of a customer when opening an account, and when you have opened an account for a periodic review or event review. Yeah, a customer can either be an individual or an entity, yeah? But per regulation, 
all banks and financial institutions, including non-financial institutions, must make sure that their customers are genuinely who they claim to be. So the onus is on the bank to develop a KYC process. That's why bank creates KYC procedures and define what the bank is looking for involving necessary actions and make sure that the customers are real, assesses and monitor the risk as well. Uh, so KYC also re re requires um, KYC documentation. Uh, when you identify the customers, verify basic information. Some other banks actually are moving into the eKYC. It means electronic KYC. There's another aspect of KYC it's called KYB, which means know your business. Uh, that's a different area that we would be. We've touched that. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of clips on our um, YouTube channel. If you want to request for it, then yes, please feel free. Okay, I uh, will talk Hi. about the risk factor. Hello. Yeah, I can't see anything on the screen. Are you? Um, can you see gray and black? Yeah, is that why it's on? Yes. Okay, that's <laughs> Yeah, we just started, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm just refreshing, I'm just trying to recap. Um, bear with me one minute, actually. Uh, let me bring that down. Just to recap that. Um, bear with me, please. Okay, I think I'm on today's page now. Yeah. Okay. I keep, sorry, keep bouncing me back for some reason. Uh, bear with me, I've just got some technical issues trying to. So that real quick. Yes, all sorted now. Okay, so we're talking about KYC today. Um, I'm just going to give you an highlight. We already talked about a lot of aspects of KYC. We talked about identification. We talked about verification. We talked about um, sources. How you um, documents, are you identify a customer, are you verify a customer? Um, hi, I think someone is on, on mute. It's not on mute. Can you please mute yourself if you're just joining? Thank you. So uh, we also talked about the, the four factors of KYC. We talked about um, um, the customer risk, product risk, uh, uh, delivery and channel. We also talked about um, PEP. We also talked about um, different areas of um, KYC in terms of the assessment, talk about nature of a business and source of fun and all those things that we've learned in the last four days, we would put them into practice today. Okay, now we're talking about KYC highlights. So this is basically an highlight of KYC uh, where we have a customer, um, assuming the customer identification is this, this is what the customer has completed in the form. However, this is literally identification. This is just identification. Identification really requires gathering information about our customer, and verification means that we verify them using documentation. Yeah. Let's say, for example, as part of you trying to verify this information, you're unable to obtain the nationality or the place or the place of birth. There are two ways you go about it. Either you go publicly to actually search for that information, or you go back to the relationship manager to say, I request for that information, please provide me with information. If they provide you with the basic information, you verify it and that it's been completed. This is just all, this is just the definition of KYC. KYC literally means identifying, verifying, and monitoring. And the, the, the review is approved. Now, this is just the KYC I like. This is what we've been talking about the last four days in different, in diverse um, 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 areas. Now let's talk about EML. Like I said, I'm going to mention and I like about EML. Then I'm going to transaction monitoring. So EML literally means um, anti-money laundry. Um, it requires email sanctions, screening, um, address media, new screening. Literally means, let's take for example, we have a customer. Um, this customer, um, you know, goes through uh, verification. 
and we screen the customer through maybe in numbers of twos. As part of that, the customer can actually come up in, you know, potential matches, which means we don't know which is which. Then the AML screening analyst will go into each of those alerts, the code and potential match, and review it against the KYC profile we have. So it could actually verify is this is it a person or not? Then you know, first match, it could be a first match, it could be a true match, it could be a true match. What is a true match? It means it is indeed the person, right? Because of there's some um, scenarios that we consider, but that's not what I'm trying to talk about today because I'm just giving you an highlight, yeah? So this is just an AML screening highlight. Now, when you have a completed KYC profile, you have a complete AML screening profile, together you assess them to create a CRA. The CRA means customer risk assessment, yeah? And the CRA will then make a determination if the customer should be assessed or should be uh, completed as a low risk customer, a standard risk customer or high risk, yeah? And I expect everyone should have the IDNB metrics, um, the KYC customer profile and customer risk assessment. If you are on this call and you haven't received these three documents, please can you let me know now before I start because you need your laptop and you also need to always reference this documentation when I start now. Anyone on the call who doesn't have this document, you can unmute yourself and let me know. Um, okay. Uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. So I'm just going to start by, can everyone still see my screen, just to be sure? Yeah? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. All right, so I'm just going to drag out the first document. So the first document I'll be dragging out is the IDNV document. So I'm just going to explain what that means so we know what we're talking about. I'm trying to open it up here with me. I compare it sometimes slow. So this is IDNV. This, this is the first document. Um, what this literally means is it is, remember we said KYC is all about identification, verification, and monitoring. This is ID and B, means identification application. It's a document, the matrix that helps you identify what is needed and what's not needed, yeah? And how you can actually look for those information. So these are requirements. These are core requirements. These are core documentation and sources, yeah? We have two types of sources. So remember, we talked about primary source and we talked about secondary source. So what this means is if you're trying to identify or verify a living name, it means that you can use the commercial register to to um to verify a legal name you can use to verify legal form registered address principal address nature of the business proof regulation wherever but you can use it for social form you can use it for ownership ub identification you can use it for verification of your issues you can use it for set law partner you can use it for social wealth if the information is there so when i say you can use the documentation it doesn't mean that the information will be there it means if the information is there then yes it's acceptable if the even if the information is there you can use it for social form because it's not acceptable basically i'm just trying to give you understanding on reliance of documentation so we have a lot of document that we've classified as reliable as a primary source so we have passport we have utility bill local government authority certificate incorporation board resolution and the list goes on and on so these are the ones we're talking about secondary source i don't need to go into details because we've spent a lot of time explaining what this type of sources are and how the whole logic now I'm going to put that aside and I'm going to bring on where that document. Blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, um, I think I'll bring up the KYC profile. Yeah. Here it means loading up. Um, why that is loading? Let me open. Yep. Yeah. So this is the KYC profile. Um, let me see how I can enlarge this. So this is the KYC profile, basically. What it means is we're saying um, this is an existing customer. It's saying this is the KYC customer profile. This one is applicable for onboarding, periodic review, and event-driven review for bank and non-bank institution. Now, this is not the type of form that you would see if you were working in a bank. It's just a representation of a document that owes the information of a customer. In most banks, it's very sophisticated because you're not using just a form, you're using 
a system that holds data, yeah? But the idea is the same. It means that there would be a database that holds information for workflow information or workflow two, yeah? Or workflow flow two. So let's take, for example, let's assume this is the form you're using. The relationship manager, the person who actually owns this customer, his name is John Smith. This customer name is HSBC Bank PLC, yeah? The product is they have a trade finance and a corresponding banking relationship with our banks. Now, let's call it Gray and Black International Bank, yeah, for example. Now, it says the legal form, now this is, we're looking at the profile of the customer. The legal form says it's a public limited company, it's valid. Our primary regulator information is not there, we don't have it, which means everywhere you see KYC deficiency, it means we have to source that information. Type of the industry, we have financial intermediate. We have, is it active or inactive? It says the account is active. Expected and after transaction consistent. So these are all information. Length of the relationship. How long have we been with this? Have this customer been with us? It says nine years. Mode of account opening. It says face to face. It says country of parent company in the United Kingdom. Blah blah blah. Even where he, the, we have the information, yes, he's still telling us it's valid. Which means every time you see this is the action. Every time you see invalid for this documentation, it means you need to verify that information or source that information if that information is not available. So just because the information is available doesn't mean it's valid. It means you need to reconfirm it. And that's the purpose of KYC. KYC always reconfirm information to make sure that the customer has not changed. So if you've been following, following us from Series 1, you would, have, you would understand that KYC requires identification of information and verification of those information. Yeah? And verification requires documentation. So we're going to take this as an example, and we're going to run through it using the calculator. So let me bring up the calculator. Um, I think I kept the calculator on the sanctions. Um, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, brilliant. I'm just going to bring this out. Um, okay. So this is the calculator. And what this calculator literally means is, let me see if I could expand it for you a little bit. Yeah. So this calculator, this calculator is actually, is your job then now to complete it. In terms of the logic, what is going on behind, don't even bother about that because that's for financial crime discussion on weighting um, uh, EWRA and how we've actually come into our weighting of what should be weighted and what shouldn't be weighted. But for your own, for the foundation process or the session, you click on this, so you look at the form that you have. If the form says there's a new customer or existing customer, you select it. If you, you look at legal form, if your form actually has valid information, whatever legal form you say it is, then you go in there and you select the correct one. Primary regulator. So in this case, I'm going to put HS, HSBC Bank PLC. Yeah. Customer ID. Let me see what the customer ID is, just to be so we're just following it. Um, template. So that if customer ID, do I have the customer ID here? There should be GMB number says. It is this number, yeah? Okay, so I go back to the form and put the customer ID in here. Um, wherever, wherever, let me see. Yeah, that's the customer ID. Today's date is 0, 03. Um, I'm just trying to complete this as much as possible. Um, completed by Olu Amoye, yeah? So this is how, because by the time you're done with this, you need to submit it for us to review it and we'll provide our feedback and we'll provide another round of it, yeah? So primary regulator, you go in here, yeah? you select what regulator. So the regulator comes with different countries. So now if this customer, if your customer is in the UK, you go down here and you look for United Kingdom. So these are all Brazil, wherever you go for, you can look for United Kingdom and select what you verify or was on the form. So United Kingdom, is it Bank of England? No. Is it... Uh, charity is it this financial product authority that's the correct word so every time you select something he adds to this and it's telling you the customer is currently low if you want to know at the bottom this is it it's telling you it is low this is the automated calculation if there's a reason for you to override there's a very risky situation it will tell you that and tell you the reason under this section uh, okay let's just continue the industry what does the industry say um where is the come again that is it uh, all this so what does the industry say does this give us an industry um, type of industry is financial intermediate intermediation 
So we go back in here, we select financial intermediation. Um, there you go. Um, is the customer privately owned? So it says select only one out of the four cells. So you can only select one because they talk about the same thing. So is it privately owned? If it's privately owned, you have an option. Privately owned with no presence of this, UBO. So how do I know that? Now, if I go into the form, why do I keep losing this form? If I go back into the form, yeah, and I look for my ownership, where can I find my ownership? Uh, so I have my ownership, it says it's KYC deficient. Yeah. Now, how do I then know my ownership? Because I need to complete this information. Yeah. Now let's do a, a, a very preliminary search real quick. Um, I'll do a quick search on that. And so now we're dealing with HSBC by PLC. We're still going to talk about trans transaction monetary. It's very important that you understand this first. So the, our customer is, remember, it is very important that the name has been verified before you even start your due diligence. Why? Because we have HSBC Bank PLC, we have HSBC Bank Limited, we have HSBC Limited Bank PLC, we have HSBC, this HSBC that, excuse me, there are a thousand and one HSBC out there, but you must know which HSBC you're dealing with. Just because they are just, or they're all called HSBC doesn't mean they are the same HSBC, and I'll show you. So let me take, for example, HSBC uh, Bank Limited. There is HSBC Bank Limited, Dakar, there's HSBC Bank Limited, Bangladesh, Singapore, Zubai, there's a lot of them. Uh, but what we're talking about is HSBC Bank PLC. There is London, different one. Yeah. So if I click on that, now I'm trying to understand the ownership, remember? So maybe I want to put in um, the ownership structure. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, if you're actually working in a proper bank, um, I just can't show you my assets. I've got a GMB assets, but it's very confidential. I would have shown you a tool that we use to search for all this information. You've got tools like Bankers Amanak that you can actually use to access all this. Um, the, the, or, you know, there is a lot of tools, KYC registry and stuff. But let us do a normal public due diligence, yeah? Because that's what you would be using the majority of the time. Now, HSBC is giving us their structure. Now, remember, we're talking about ownership, and the, the main reason why we the main reason why we look for the ownership is to identify the UBO written ownership. You can see how the structure is. This is HSBC structure. Now, where our customer, the customer, our customer is HSBC Bank PLC. Now, we're looking. You can see they have HSBC Mexico, HSBC this, HSBC Canada, HSBC this. They have different legal names. That's why I said it's very important. This is our customer here. Now. It says they're HSBC Bank PLC. Now, who owns our customer? Our customer is own 100%. The reason why I know it's 100% is if they don't put a percentage on it, it means it is 100%. If they put a percentage that they're indicating, it is not 100%, yeah? So for example, where you see this one, it means it's 100%, where you see 100%, this is 19.01. So for our customer, this is an 100%. Our customer is 100% owned by HSBC UK Holdings Limited. Now, who owns this customer? Remember, we're searching for 25% for a CDD or STD. Who owns this guy? Now, because this person is an entity, we need to drill for that. Now, we're saying this guy is owned by HSBC Odin PLC. Now, we have a problem because now we've linked it. Our customer, now I can then do this to say HSBC by PLC is owned by HSBC um, UK Odin. So if I go into my form, what I should do is I should complete this and say HSBC, the, oh, I'm sorry, not here, the ownership. Where's the ownership now? Yeah, this is ownership. The name of the first owner, the percentage 100%, is it publicly? No, no, no. I'll put in that information. But I'm not trying to dwell on that now. I just want to just explain this ownership part. Now, we have a problem. Why? Please, if you have any question, please feel free to omit yourself. I'm happy. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm just talking to myself and you're not following. So we have HSBC Bank PLC. HSBC Bank PLC is 100% owned by HSBC UK Odins. HSBC UK Odins is also 100% wide because it doesn't indicate any percentage. Owned by HSBC Odin PLC. Now we have a problem. Who owns HSBC Odins is where the problem is. Now you go and do a further search. HSBC uh, Odins PLC. Now I go in here and say, um, 
um, HS, BC, Holdings, PLC. Yeah? Ownership. Ownership structure. Now it's giving me a breakdown. So these are some some website that you can rely on. Some are not reliable. We just need to be very careful and follow the idea and the what document you can use. So that's where the idea be coming to. Um, so it's saying HSBC Holding PLC is one of the largest blah blah blah. Now this is the breakdown. Uh, so this is the managers. Then the ownership is this. Now they're saying HSBC Holdings is owned by yeah, it's owned by um, Ang Seng Bank Limited. How many percentage? 61.1%. We have Bank of Communication Co. 40%. We have the Southern British Bank, 29%. We have this, which is now, you can see that is now not making sense because it's giving me in this value. It's impossible for this to be 80%. At the same time, this is to be 60% because if you're looking at the ownership, everything must be 100%. So if you're looking at this, then it's saying, for example, let me go into this one to see further. Um, uh, let's go back to the, the, the main software. Let's go to the software to understand the shareholders. Because using different multiple third party, like I said, kind of confuses you. It's usually good to go to the main source. Um, let's check from this. Um, where is the information? You can check the annual report. If you check into your IDMB, your IDMB will tell you, for example, if you go into your IDMB, it can tell you the kind of document that you can search for. So we're looking for ownership. And ownership is this. We can use Commerce Fair Register. We can use independent annual report. We can use government website. So let's try the independent annual report. That means we're going to try HSBC independent annual report. So this is where the job comes into play, the annual report, because you need to do a lot of research. So let's say 2018. Um, HSBC audience annual report. Because you know what you're looking for in there, right? So let's download this. Use the information and allow and pops up okay so now that i have this i just go and do a control control f and find for shareholders um skip this shareholders it's not what i'm looking for um there's a simpler way I could go about it, but I just don't want to go through the shortcut because I need to take you guys through this process. That you need to do the due diligence. This is what due diligence means. You need to review and understand because the customer you're dealing with. Um, because you don't have to do your final and I'm sure you. Because for you to complete that, you have to complete it to the best of your knowledge and having documentation to back it up. So if someone actually asks you, for example, in the document, they say, um, because there's going to be a QA, the QA will just review it. If, if someone actually then asks you, okay, um, where is that document? Um, I think it's this one. No, this one. Yeah. So one is reviewing it, and he says, say for example, you pick uh, privately owned with no presence of UPO. If I'm doing my check, I want to know, I want to see an evidence that proves that it's privately owned and there is no UPO. Then I have to go into it. Or if you choose government entity, own more than 50% of it, or government entity own less than I want to see it. Or if you say it's listed as well, I also want to see it. So just to simplify this, because I already I've done a lot of research on all, all these banks in the past, but I have an idea because I follow stock. So let me give you a simpler way to go out around because we have a lot to cover. Um so let's put HSBC Bank PLC. FT, FT means Financial Times. Yep, you can use London Stock Exchange. So I click into it. 
just about you knowing your way around information and that's why i provided you with the matrix the matrix help you to navigate your way around where you can go real fast to get the information rather than spending a thousand hours searching around the internet with no specific information okay um it's not coming up um just taking time yeah so now this is hsbc holding plc yeah now that is the that's the guy that we're looking for now hsbc holding says on the financial times to show us what is listed and what's not listed all you have to do is when, once you get in here just go to the bottom where it says key statistics yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yeah, but I think on FT, you don't. It's not everyone that have access to this, right? You need to subscribe no, or something. No, it's definitely free. Hundred percent free. So that's what I've just done. I just went into Google. So, for example, I put in HSBC um, audience and put FT. Yeah. It gives you all the information. So you can you can the same way you can put Barclays. FT. Yeah. It shows you the information. So this is Barclays. And I'll show you a couple of ones as well. Let me use JP Morgan. So I can show you the difference. Okay, JP Morgan FT. So this is JP Morgan as well. Um, so I'm just going to compare the three. So I'll use the three to explain. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So if you look at the key stat statistics, now what does this all this nonsense mean? All you need is just this two information. Yeah. Now what he says is shares outstanding and free float. Shares outstanding means that's the shares in the words of the company and free float is what they're actually trading. Now to understand who owns HSBC, you divide the share outstanding over the free floats, which means if I bring up my calculator, um, um, yep. Uh, yep. So if I bring up my calculator, and the share out the share outstanding and the free float is now I'll put the free float is uh, twenty point three zero divided by twenty point three seven equals to times hundred. So what it means is ninety nine point six five percent of the company's shares is listed on london stock exchange so i don't have to go further right now if anyone asks me and i'm putting my commentary i will put in in here to say is it publicly listed and recognized because it's london stock exchange i put in publicly listed 50 percent recognized uh, publicly listed less than 50 percent no uh, publicly listed more than 50 percent recognized that's the answer yeah and if anyone asks you you're the, you have to provide and evidence of this, which is what I've just shown you, to so say this is the evidence of it. In your summary, um, in your KYC profile, so the KYC profile is this. Um, let me see, where is it again? I keep losing it. Um, not this one. Yeah, this one. Your KYC profile, you have your assessment here. This is called the KYC and analyst customer assessment. So you type in there to put in as well as you you put in the information here so what i will complete in here is hs instead of this kyc deficiency entity is owned by um where is the information again before i lose that group structure entity is owned by uh this is our customer it's owned by hsbc 
UK Audience Limited, 100%. HSBC, HSBC UK Audience Limited is 100% owned by HSBC Odin PLC. And HSBC Odin PLC is 99.6 listed on London Stock Exchange, which means it's impossible for any single person to own it more than 10% or more than 25%. Now, it's not, I'm not saying it's impossible, but from a due diligence, it's, 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 it's verified. Why? If everyone is going to own 10% or 25%, they will have to own it through London Stock Exchange. They will have to own it through the shares, which means that they bought the shares and they go through a level of due diligence. And that is a transfer of risk. So it's, the onus is not on us to do the verification for those individuals. The onus is on how they've actually acquired it. So as long as we know that they're on a recognized stock exchange, that's all that matters. You document it and you move on, yeah? So from our assessments, going back to our assessments, for HSBC, this is the answer. So this would be non-applicable because it says you select only one out of the four. You put this one as a non-applicable as well. So you leave it blank if there's not. BRS shares, there's no BRS shares. We haven't identified any BRS shares. Um, PEP, well, you can know that. So you carry out your screening. So you carry out the NA. Um, the only time you need a source of wealth is, it says UBO, significant controller. In this case, there is no, there's no UBO. So it means that we, we don't need a source of wealth. Source of wealth literally means you have to select one of these. So you leave that plan. We go to the next one. What products are we offering the customer? Um, in this case, we put in, where is my form again? Um, da, da, da. Okay, no. So here's my form. Yeah, okay. I hope you guys are following though, because I don't want you guys to lose me before I get back to the slide. So this other one, the next stage is you then complete product type. What type of product are we offering the customer? The list of information, we're offering the customer trade. We're also offering the customer a correspondent banking. Why, how do I know that? Because it's in here. It says, where's the product again? You need to saturate this information. Um, what's the product? What's the product? Mode of account, length. Um, change it at the, at the top, yeah. Product, product line is trade, finance, and correspondent banking. So you click your trade, finance, and correspondent banking. You select books, yeah? Now, the purpose of the relationship literally means, what is the purpose of this? What's the purpose of this? That should have come from the business. So I'm just going to put trade. I'm just going to put correspondent banking. So it should be on the KYC profile. Um, vote stroke, correspondent banking. Yeah. Is the account active or inactive? It says it is active. It's on there. Remember, we saw it. So is account active? Active is active, which is valid. So everywhere you see invalid, it means that, you know, so... It means that you cannot, you need to verify. Where it says primary regulator, have we got it to the part of the primary regulator? Yeah, so I put in United Kingdom Financial Conduct Authority. How do I know that? So again, I go back in here. I go, maybe this is your first time doing KYC. You just want to understand who is the, who is the primary regulator in the UK. Um, UK Financial Regulator. Um, who is that? It? it tells you it is. The financial conduct authority is the conduct of blah, 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 financial markets in the UK. So they are financial conduct authority. Okay, if I know that FCA, financial conduct authority, is the UK, so financial, I need to confirm that HSBC is regulated. Financial conduct, let me put FCA. HSBC, Bank, PLC, um, FCA. Okay, so it says HSBC, Bank, PLC, FCA register. Easy. Um, so I go in there, I look for it, and this is it. You can actually, you have to evidence this, you PDF it, and you evidence it, because this is your evidence that you did your due diligence, and indeed it is. So HSC Bank PLC, then I have to confirm, is it, are they, what's the reference, then information, because sometimes they might have information that, yeah, they've lost their license or whatever, wherever it is. It says type, is regulated, the company, this is a unique number, current status. It is authorized. A firm that is given permission to provide regulated product and services. Effective date, 
this. So you're confirmed. You PDF this. How do you PDF it? You just go, you save it. Um, because everything, that, remember, everything you do requires evidence. So you PDF it, save as M PDF, whatever, whatever, and that's your evidence right there. Because every field you complete requires an evidence. There's no such things as I know. If you know, we need an evidence for it. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. We have expected, it says it's consistent or not consistent, it's consistent. Now, let's, how do I know that? Um, so the form expected and it's valid. Information is valid. Length of the relationship says nine years is valid. Mode of it, they say face to face is valid. So I go in here. Um, length of the relationship says it's nine years. So it says between zero and two years, no. Between two years or five years, above five years, that's what I choose. Mode of accounting says face to face. Um, other product, you don't have to say that. It says not mandatory. We're going to country of incorporation. Where is this guy incorporated? Now, if you go back to the IDLB document, um, where's my IDLB document actually? Uh, no, not this one. Um, just got too many documents here. Sorry, I've got four screens right in front of me, so it's just messing with my head. I'm trying to drag it. Um, so this is IDLB. Now, what I'm looking for is country of incorporation. Now, how do I know that? What documents can I use for country of incorporation to verify the address and country of incorporation? Incorporation means where it was registered. So where is HSBC registered? What documents can I use? I can use commercial register. I can use independent under report. I can use recognize. I can use our regulator, global recognized regulator, which is FCA. So I'm going to use two just so you know that you can actually use, you, you need one, but just to show you that the information exists, could exist in two, three, four, or 10, as long as it's acceptable. Now, first of all, let me focus on this. It says here, yeah, principal place of business is not a registered address. Principal place of business means that's where they're operating. That's where they carry out their, their um, operation. It means 8 Canada Square, London. This is an indicator that the company is not a shell company, why? Right? Because they're trading, yeah? Um, where are they registered? I need to know where they're registered. Now, remember when we talked about um, primary sources. If I'm to check where this company is registered, HS HSBC Bank PLC, where do you think I should go? Um, where do you think I should go? Who registered them? It is it's the UK company house. Mm -hmm. company Sorry? Else, yeah. Yeah, company else, right? So HSBC, HSBC Bank PLC. Always remember, you cannot mix up the name. Um, company else. So UK, for example, it gives me that information. That's HSBC Bank PLC company house. I pull it up. Um, I hope it's still active. Otherwise, you might have to send a report. So HSBC Bank PLC says registered address is the same. The company status is active. The company is a public limited company. Incorporated this. Nature of the business, this is the SIC code and the NIS code, yeah? So they also said previous company, the name was formerly known as Midland Bank Public Limited. They changed their name, the period between 1880 and 1999. So I have the basic information there. You PDF this, you save this. This is also uh, your evidence. Now your, your job is just to go into all those requirements that you're required to complete, search for the information, identify them, verify them, and complete the assessment. That is the job of the KYC. Now, it requires a level of research. The country is the United Kingdom. So I go for United Kingdom. Um, I hope I'm not, the time is almost nine. Yeah, I go to United Kingdom, because I need to highlight the transaction monitoring as well. So I select that. Country of operation is operating in the United Kingdom as well. Only operating in the United Kingdom as part of this particular one. So I'll go and select United Kingdom. Parent company, that's the one that we saw. That's the Odin company. It's also in the United Kingdom. Not to waste time. Um, but you can check that in your free time. I'll go and select United Kingdom. Um, country of business dealing. Well, uh, let me double check that. From the from the folder, um, yeah. So it says the registered address is invalid. We validated it. The primary address is invalid. We also validated it. Now it says country of business dealing is valid. 
He operates in, he has business dealing and transaction in Turkey, Iraq, and Russia. So I go in here, I put Iraq, Turkey, and Russia. Business dealing, I put um, Turkey, uh, Iraq, and Russia. Um, Turkey. And Russia. Um, where is R? Uh, Russia, Russia Federation. Brilliant. So now we're completing that. You can see that this is now saying it's three standard. Now, initially, when we started this low, the more information we add now, it's telling me here yeah, action. Escalate override the second line of defense. Why? Why do I have to escalate? He's telling the reason for the action is because a business dealing is in a highest risk country. So by the virtue of you completing this information by your findings, this is already telling you, yes, it's a standard risk, but there is also an item risk of money laundry, which means that it will be overridden and it needs compliance assessment. But well, you don't stop still, you just continue because you need this completed before you then send it out to compliance. Um, so the other one is country of taxation. I don't want to waste your time, it's the UK as well, because they're in the UK. They might actually have multiple taxation, to be honest, but that's left for you to don't check that in your free time. And I will assess, we will assess what you've done. Um, so there's no wrong, right or wrong answer, just give it a go whenever you're free, because if you don't try it, then you wouldn't know. So now, this is also being completed for KYC. You complete this information as much as possible. This one, you put no requirement. You can put your comment here. If you feel it's not required, you can say not required because customer does not have a UBO. Yeah? Okay. So if you've completed all this, then it tells you this. However, this needs to be completed. But from an AML perspective, or guys that do screening, they will be the only one to determine this because you can't determine it from a KYC perspective. Those guys would have done the screening, but I think they've done the screening already, maybe probably, and they've given us the information here. So if you go down here, they said this is AML risk factor assessment, sanction screening PEP, and they validated all this data. They said, yes, this validated, we can actually go ahead and rely on it. So internet deny, no internet deny match, no regulatory action, no regulatory action in the last 10 years. Sanction match in the last 10 years. They say no sanction match, license revoke, no license revoke or litigation. Are, are you aware of SAR filed in the last? It means suspicious activity reporting, no suspicious activity reporting. Let's go here and complete it for them. Internet line, it's, it's not applicable. Um, it says regulatory action, not applicable. Um, currently sanctioned in the last five years, no. Um, adverse media says no. Um, litigation. Says no. Are we aware of any SAR filing? We say no. So this has been completed now. It's saying it's 3.1, and 3.1 is giving us a standard. And although it's giving us a standard, it means action escalates over. So what you do is you PDF this and you send it to your, um, you send it to us as well. Um, once you carry out a, um, or you can just send it. You don't even have to PDF. You can send it the way it is. And send us a copy. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you guys a new KYT profile, which would not be in a PDF form, it should be in a Word document. So you can type your assessment, what you find, what you think is right, what you think is not right, where you think you might need help or where you think you don't need help. And if we assess it and we realize that there is a common team among everyone, particular failing, we'll call a webinar and we analyze it under one hour. So we'll put everyone back in the room and we analyze areas that people feel we're not going to call anyone's name out we're just going to analyze it but however if we re, re, if we find out that majority of people actually passed then we'll just send our comment and we'll figure out the few people who did not actually pass it properly and we would explain in detail or we'll call you back for another session if you're part of a gmb um community because we have a full um two-day operational um, um training session um it's coming up i think in, in less than um, seven weeks from now and um, we're going to provide you guys with a login so you can actually access uh, our portal so that's where you'll be carrying out your review so it won't be on an excel format this way okay
So let's go back to any question before I move back to the slide and talk about transaction monitoring before we wrap this up because we're almost eating nine o'clock. Any question? Hello. Hi. Now, just a quick one. Yeah. And um, regarding customer due diligence. Yes. Um, we've got SDD, CDD, and EDD. Yes. So let's say in a situation where you're meant to do SDD. Yeah. But you went there to do over the board and do EDD. What was the yeah. quality assurance implication for that? Well, the quality assurance implication, there, there are two two ways here. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, they're not bothered because you've done over the board, which means that the customer is not at risk. But then um, whoever you're working with or whoever is your line manager might actually be concerned because the person would uh, feel like you're doing over the board and you're wasting time because you might have about 8,000. So it's not more a, a, a discussion of either you did um, either you cover the risk or not. It's not a, a discussion of do you know what you're doing? Does that make any sense? So because because the 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 idea is um, when you have when you're under pressure in some organization, um, especially when you're dealing with revelation and you're reviewing a file of maybe you're reviewing three files a day, four files a day, some bank reviewing two files, three files, depending on your process, and you can't you're actually doing more than you should be doing. If it happens the first time, maybe they could wait. The second time, they might want to call you to the room and see if you understand what you're doing. Do you understand the difference? You know, are you reading the standard? Are you reading their procedure? Because what I'm actually providing you is just a global standard. Different banks have their own requirements, but it is similar. So if you have an idea, then you understand what I'm talking about. But from a QA perspective, it might come up as a fail, but not a regulatory fail. Because when they are reviewing from a QA perspective, the three type of fail. There's regulatory fail, there's operational operational risk fail, and there is process fail. So in that regard, yeah, you might fall under operational risk or process fail. It won't fall under regulatory because you, you, you are not putting any risk to the bank from a regulatory perspective. Okay. Does that make any sense? Yeah? yeah. Any other question? Any other question, guys, before I move into the last part of this and just discuss and give you an highlight? Um, I'm not going to be going deep into transaction monitoring, to be honest, because transaction monitoring actually uh, requires a two full blown day to discuss this. And I might not even be enough, you might need a follow up, but I'll give you a flair so you understand what transaction monitoring means and what it looks like and how that ties into KYC. Okay, TM. TM stands for transaction monitoring. So this is introduction to transaction monitoring. A number of times I have identified that uh, some people working in transaction monitoring never even had a solid KYC, excuse me, a solid KYC um, um, foundation. And it's always affected them. I've worked with a couple of people that keep coming back to me to ask me questions about what do I do, how do I go about it. And I keep wondering, what, how did you even start transaction monitoring without having a basic understanding of KYC? So now that you guys actually have a basic understanding of KYC, at least to a certain level, let's talk about transaction monitoring. So what exactly is transaction monitoring? Transaction monitoring, um, I could say, is a core segment of any bank AML program. Why? Transaction monitoring system, um, they, they are set up to monitor customer transactions, trade transactions, wire payments, and other activities as well, yeah? They're usually a system that, that have been tuned um, to capture a lot of suspicious activity based on different and various regulatory acts, yeah? And I'll explain what I mean by that. And so for some of you guys that, you know, that are already registered for a transaction monitoring um, um, uh, session coming up, uh, we will be talking much more deeper in terms of system tuning, alert piercing, and payment screening as well. But I'm just going to give you an highlight here. So this is let, let's take for example, this is the system that they use in the bank. It, it doesn't look like this, this is a just representation from um, a, a presentation um, perspective. It's just to give you a flow of it. So we have a system that actually monitors our customer. 
there are a set of rules that are incorporated into the system. The system is like a system, a machine, a proper system, a software system that is smart enough only based on the rules that it's been included. The primary method of these rules is to detect suspicious activity through different rules and scenarios. The scenarios can reach from scenario one, two, three, four. So for the guys that are actually coming for the next session for transaction monitoring, we'll talk about the different types of scenarios we have, how the rules actually applies, and how we can actually tune a transaction monitoring system and how that actually works. Rules are one of the most important portion of transaction monitoring software because these rules detect the majority of suspicious activity. Some, some rules are cash structuring. Uh, some rules will capture high risk country. Some rules will capture wire rules and velocity. Rules are generally queries that, that reveals data that reside in, the, in this transaction monitoring system. And these queries have parameters. Now, I'm not trying to sound too technical, but there are some people on this call that you know might are getting into that space of transaction monitoring. They've been working in KYC for a very long time. So, I'm just trying to just highlight that as well. So this query would have parameters or filters that are hard coded. Now, what I mean by that is these rules and scenarios are embedded into the transaction monitoring system. So they're actually embedded inside of it. And the scenarios too are also embedded into it to create a logic. Now the logic would be something like, if rule one, if a customer meets rule one criteria, and rule three criteria, it should create this particular alert. If rule one, because diff, um, um, customer behavior is very erratic and the transaction is a lot. So this actually captures different type of scenarios. And for you to capture scenarios, they have to be a rule and a scenario and a logic that actually calculate this in a very smart way. Sometimes they even use artificial learning, yeah? So what this means for you is that it, it creates a version of rules to accomplish what one complex rule can do. Yeah, and sometimes some very sophisticated system that I've worked with have, have more complex rule that will often give you more parameters and filtering capability. Okay, back to layman terminology. Yeah, now we have a set of rules that has been included in this. We have scenarios that has been included in this. What this means is these rules then work and begin to search and scan the entire, entire bank. If a customer actually hits this, now, for example, if you look at that screen, the alert is actually blinking to tell you we something has happened for this particular customer. Now, if you pull up the file, it gives you something like this to tell you um, the alert type is on Russian beneficiary. It means that the, the alert is identified Russian beneficiary. Now, the, our customer is XYZ Bank, and the beneficiary is the Libya beneficiary. That is why he has triggered this information for the transaction monitoring team to pick up this particular alert and review it extensively. So because this is said blocked or not, it said blocked, yes, which means this transaction, there's a wire transaction that is pending and needs to be released. And it's called an MT202. MT202 is a type of transaction that is, is rooted through suite. So basically this transaction monitoring is actually giving you the information on why it has been alerted. Now, if you look at the reason, it's saying the customer country is in Turkey, the beneficiary in Libya. That's the reason why, because the lighted in red. Is the KYC updated? He said yes, last updated in 2019, and it's valid. Brilliant. Now, amount is 22 million US dollars and it's blocked. It. So now this is a live payment, it's called a real life payment, which means that it has been blocked and we need someone to look at it now, 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 review it and release the transaction or block the transaction and report it to NCA for some reason, maybe through suspicious activity. So if you're a TM analyst, what's the first thing you do when you get an alert like this? You pull up the KYC profile of the individual because, because without the KYC, you can't understand what we are even doing with the customer in the first place. So the KYC profile, like all the things that you KYC guys have been doing to verify, to make sure that the information is accurate as possible, if the information in the KYC is not accurate, then it impacts the transaction monitoring. Does that see, do you see how that actually connects now? The KYC profile, all the work that you guys have been doing, the KYC, the AML, someone is relying totally on it to monitor the customer. Because without a valid and quality data from the KYC, the transaction monitoring rules and scenarios, all the work that has been done and all those logic might not be that effective. Yeah? And also, we're going to be talking about, for the other guys uh, that are attending the other session, we have a sanction section. We'll talk about how that actually impacts the sanction controls as well. So some of you want to get into the sanction areas. So if I pull up the XYZ KYC profile, 
it will give me information like, you know, normal that you pull up the KYC profile, like what we pull, we will see the source of call, we see the nature of the business, we see UB identification is there, customer base, expected an actual transaction, what we're expecting the customer to do, what the customer is doing, sanction history, adverse media news history, pep connection, litigation, source of wealth, addresses, operation and dealings. Now, this information is what you would then use, oh, hold on one minute, the beneficiary is what? Um, Patent Industrial Limited, okay, then what's the issue? The issue here is um, our customer is transferring money to Patent Industrial Limited in Libya. Then one of the, one I would want to go is, I want to see the purpose of the relationship with this customer and the nature of the business of this customer. If the nature of the business of this customer actually involves what this is in line with this, so Patent Limited might be into plastic and our customer might be financing maybe an LC, um, um, wherever, wherever, letter of credit or wherever. And if it makes sense, yes. But then I look at the amount, 22 million. Why is it 22 million? I look at the expected and actual. I also look at the, um, um, historical sanction. There's no sanction on them previously, no adverse video on them. But why are they dealing with this? Do we know that they'll be dealing with Libya? Yes, it could be. It could be under the scale of address, operation, and dealing. So if you see Libya under the dealing that, yes, the KYC have signed it up to say, yes, we know they'll be dealing with Libya. Yes, we know they'll be dealing with Turkey. Yes, we know all this. Then you said, yes, then you put your rationale and you investigate. You do all your investigation. You make sure that. It is not raising any red flag. And the AML or the alert investigator outcome would either be a true alert, which means if you're saying it's a true alert, it means that yes, it is very risky and we should stop the control, or it's a false alert, which means it's false. And if you're saying it's true or you're saying it's false, you need to provide your rationale on why you think it's true and false. So this is just a basic explanation of what transaction monitoring does. But transaction monitoring is not just limited to payments. They're limited to customer behavior patterns, a lot of areas in transaction monitoring. But having a very good understanding of KYC then moves you into different areas of the AML control, financial control, bribery and corruption, sanction. Like currently, I work as a sanction expert um, advising and also I work as an AML and also do training. So the different areas in financial crime that you can actually get into, you can get yourself into, which is really good. And but end of day five or five any questions so far on everything we've talked about from day one feel free to unmute yourself um you can ask me any question i'm happy to take any question let me break this out to see if anyone is actually Okay, I think we don't have too much people on today. We have just 23, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Any question? Any question? So there are just three type of people in the world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. So if you've attended a session, Please, with the knowledge and information you've got, just go make things happen. Um, if you need help, that's if you're GMB, uh, you're part of GMB community. Um, but there's some people that will kind of have a backlog on the CV. We'll review your CV and send it back to you. We update to you. And I think there's a batch of other new jobs that we might be sending out this weekend. I really don't have the time. I must apologize for that. So I'll be sending a new job. Um, I think about 16 of the new job. You know, send your CV to them. We never know what could come out of it. And if you have an interview that is urgent, then send me the job description. I'll get on the call with you. We'll pierce it together. We'll discuss it and we will talk about the, what is expected. And if there, if you need, if you still don't have the new link for our uh, interview questions, job questions, um, please let us know. We will send an updated one. Uh, we're quite struggling to track everyone at the, at the moment because we kind of lost some of our data for where we, we're, we're getting it back. That's the reason why you might be getting a, an email from us for privacy because we're trying to adhere to the GDPR um, and laws as well. So yes, if you have any other question, please feel free to ask now or send me an email if you can. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, Lou. It's Titus here. It's not a question. Uh, well, it's a question actually, but uh, not about the thing uh, about uh, recruitment. 
overseas. Do you know if Brexit is already having any impact on uh, British citizens working in Europe or, or not? No, 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 it's not. Um, so, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, at least. I think at the moment, uh, we're just, the world is even too concerned about how COVID is changing uh, the way we work rather than even looking at Brexit because I know Brexit is still ongoing. I'm following the news, but I don't think there's any significant impact. And the reason why I said that, and this is my opinion, I think majority of the skill sets this sits abroad. Um, and I've been getting a lot of calls to work in places like uh, um, Amsterdam, especially, um, Paris as well. So I'm sure you can actually work outside. And you can also work even in the US. I think the market in the US was actually springing up before this whole COVID, because especially around New York and um, some of this area, I think DC and some other areas, because I have a couple of people provide me updates from there as well. I mean, you don't have to limit your job search to um, to the UK. You can expand it a lot. Of, if you get a job in Qatar, I promise you, you're in for a big money, man. <laughs> because uh, I know a couple of people who got a job in Qatar and they're making serious money. So don't limit it to just the UK. Expand your um, horizon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other question, please? Every time I ask questions and no one is saying anything, I feel like I've done a super, super, super job job. So if there's no question, then please enjoy. Oh, I think a lot of people are actually on mute. Should I unmute them to be sure? Okay, let me unmute them. So I'll mute to Robert. I will unmute um, Shola. I will mute. So you can mute yourself if you don't have any question. I apologize for that. Just want to be sure okay. you don't have any. Hello. No question. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know, um, the code, like the MT202 code, um, yeah. what are those codes called? Just so I can do my own research as well to add on to the um, teaching. So it's just a suit code. Uh, that's what it's called. So we have a lot of um, suit codes. So those suit codes, um, are, are called messages. So we have NT103, we have NT9 something. We have a lot of NT, it means um, money transfer. That's what the NT, money transfer in the code. So when we get the code, we know what it is in the message and we can pierce it. So there's something called sweep piercing as well. But yeah, you can do your research on that one. Um, yeah. Just sweep code, they're called sweep code. Thank you. And I had one last question. Um, also, to do with the type of programs you'd be using as KYC or AML, I just wonder if you could list out a few programs that you're familiar with. When you say program, what sort of program are you talking about? Um, as in a banking systems program. So how um, the programs they have for KYC or AML. Oh, are you talking about the tools they use for KYC and AML? Yeah, that's what I mean. Oh, okay. So there's a lot of tools that they use out there, to be honest. Um, some of the, the, the common ones is, um, uh, okay, before I mention that, I'm not sure if you received any of our training pack one, because in the pack, we listed out what you need to do on a daily basis, what you'll be doing on a daily basis. There are basic information and the tools. We have LexisNexis, we have um, WorldCheck, uh, which is Thompson Realtors, we have Pecosoft, we have um, Actimize, which is used for transaction monitoring. Um, we have four tens is used for transaction monitoring. We have safe watch for sanction screening. We have data nomics, which is also used for batch screening, sanction screening. There's a lot out there. There's RDC. There is too many tools out there, but those are the common ones. Um, that there's also ESnet. There's a lot of tools out there. Thank you. I've only been through half of the training pack so far. That's why, but thank you very much. Oh, oh you're welcome. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Any other question, please? Any other question? Okay, in the absence of any other question, please enjoy your evening and have the rest of your life back. Hope to see hear from you again and catch you. Um, if you have, um, if you are part of us or you're waiting for the rest of your registration documentation and information, please let us know so we can classify you to one of the WhatsApp group as soon as possible, because that is where we will be sending the update for the jobs. So if you're not part of the WhatsApp group, you would not get the, 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 the job um, network as well. So it's important that 
you get it and apply as soon as possible. I mean, you never know what can happen. How do I become part of the WhatsApp group? Um, if, if you are registered with us, then yes, you will get it. But if you're not, then you have to register. Okay, I think I'm registered, but okay, cool. I'll double check. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hello, Olu. Hi. Yeah, this is Bookie. When are you calling? Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can talk right now after the call if you want. If you want to call me real quick. All right, no problem. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah.